So, hemlock newly adopted. It's our problem child right now. Uh, we have over 170 million hemlock trees in Michigan. Um, that's not counting the planted landscape trees that people have been uh, putting in their yards. Uh, there's at least thousands, if not more, of those around. Um, they're usually contained to the UP or northern lower. Um, and then in Drew's case, on the west side of the lower peninsula, there's a lot that grow along Lake Michigan and along the riparian zones. Um, and Michigan's having a really hard time keeping our hemlock resource already before HWA because of deer crops. They go through and they wipe out all the seedlings and saplings and we have all these mature stands, but we don't have anything coming in to replace them as they go out. And then, hemlock um, woolly adelgid came about. You know, it came over in the western states in the 20s, found its way out into the eastern states in the 50s, um, found out that it was really susceptible um, to eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock. Um, those guys really didn't do so well when it was out west. It wasn't really a big issue because western hemlock was resistant and never really filled up the populations that we see out here in the east side. Okay. Um, the insect, it feeds on the base of the needle, so you're never going to see it on the needle. You're never going to see it without a needle. Well, you might if the needles drop, but that's another Another story in itself, um, hemlocks usually take four to seven years to die uh, from HWA infestations. Usually that's because it takes a number of years for the population to build up on that tree. And then as it completely is covered, there's a hypersensitive reaction, they drop all their needles, and they actually kill themselves. So. That's uh, what we're dealing with, and this was just kind of a life cycle to look at. Uh, it's a unique life cycle. Um, they usually do most of their feeding in the winter, which is uncommon. Most people like to be warm, even insects, they like to be warm. Not these guys. These guys like to be out there in the snow. Yay for us. Um, so the best time to look for them is during the winter and into the spring. Now usually, if you want to get out and look for them, I suggest looking for them usually November through about April. After April, you have to deal with crawlers. Okay, so there's a good potential that you're, if you're going out and looking at trees, that you'll come in contact with a crawler. You'll look at another tree, and you move those crawlers. Um, if you're doing survey detection work, not as big of a deal because chances are you're probably not going to run into HWA, but if you think you did, you know, it's a good idea to have something on you to do some decon. This is some pictures of some HWA. This is a crawler, really small. If you got really good eyes, you can see it without anything, but usually you're going to look under a microscope, hand lens, something to see them. Uh, this is still pretty zoomed in, but you can still see the crawlers. The eggs are even smaller, but the good thing about the eggs are they're in, contained in the oversack, which are really easy to spot. Okay. Uh, this guy is an adult with all the wax pulled away from it. It has a really long stylet that kind of goes down at the base of the needle and then back up into the, the needle itself and feeds on the parts of the cells. Um, and then it, over there on the right side, that's a dormant system. So something that I forgot to mention is not only do they feed the most in the winter, they actually go dormant during the summer just because it's too hot. They just sit there and bake. And that's what they look like. They feed just enough to put out that halo. And then they sit there until October, November, and then they break open, and start feeding, start molting, <coughs> put on that big old sack that you guys are accustomed to seeing. Okay, so.
So some of the things that you might see um, is uh, some dieback, some discoloration in your hemlock tree. Um, there's a lot of things that will cause this, so just because you see it, you know, don't scream out HWA, but it might be a tree to look at. So uh, the ovisacs are really easy to see. If you're looking at the top, you can see them kind of if it's a heavy infestation, but you really should flip over um, the branch and look at the underside. That's where they're more prevalent and easier to see from. You know, you might see some needle drop. Usually what happens are the tips of the hemlock tree right here, these three prongs, they'll lose their needles first. And then you'll see branches with just the prongs sticking out. And that's a good indication of, you know, HWA is causing mortality there. And it's a good indication when, you know, you can't reach a branch to look at. You're looking farther up into the tree and if you just see those prongs sticking out, uh, you might want to get a full pruner or something out uh, to take a closer look at those branches. Okay. And, you know, sometimes you'll see secondary infestations related to it. Um, usually a hem elongate hemlock scale. Um, we see them in similar locations normally because um, both of them come in really well on nursery stock and landscape trees they come in together. Um, Longgate hemlock scale, not a lot is known about it. It is another invasive insect. Um, it does cause some type of uh, loss of vigor for the tree, but um, as far as we know, it's not a major component to dieback or mortality. Something else to be kind of conscious about is there's a lot of things out there that kind of look similar to ovisacs. Okay. Um, you have aphis, or aphis, aphid, um, and beech scale wax that kind of trickle down onto hemlock uh, branches that are white. Um, they usually don't have the compact form. Uh, beech scale actually is the same exact consistency as uh, hemlock oleia delgid oversack. So it's really hard sometimes to tell, you know, there's needle miner, you know, oak skeletonizer, yeah, cocoons. Um, but the big one that gets a lot of people, even after they have a lot of experience, are these spider egg sacs. And, you know, sometimes it's not too bad. You know, they're not against the twig, they're not at the base of the needle. They have a bunch of webbing around them. You can um, disregard those ones pretty easily, but there are some that look very much like open sacks and are in the right location. You know? um, so those, those you need to kind of watch out for and probably send in to have them confirmed or denied. Yeah, I would totally echo that and say that we had tons of problems with the uh, beach scale. In that it didn't always look that messy. Like a lot of that mess would get kind of weathered away and then you just have little white spots right at the leaf bases of the leaves. And so those were some of the ones that we were like, we're pretty sure this isn't, but sent it in anyway. Yep. So just being careful. Yep. So 50% of our samples is beach scale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of other things too that not on here too. Um, that we just I didn't want to bore you with 3,000 different examples of not HWA. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk a little bit about dispersal. Uh, the big one in Michigan to get everything started was nursery stock landscape trees. We, you know, pinpointed that, tried to look at where those trees went and um, go and look at those sites and try to remove as much as we could. It got ahead of us. Um, and now we're pretty much in containment mode right now. Um, but they can be dispersed through wind. Um, mammals and birds, um, big dispersal source, um, as well as humans. You know, they, you know, you cut a, a infested branch and then you move it down to the dump, uh, you could easily be moving it um, long distances that way. Um, just 
like, uh, it's important for us to kind of remember this too, it's when we're out looking for this, you know, we're actively looking for it, so if we run into it, we have a good chance of picking up crawlers if we're in that time frame, and then moving on to a new hemlock tree, so we got to really be cognizant of that. Um, but other people, you know, camping, backpacking, just hiking through the woods, they can brush it up on it if it's, you know, overgrown trail or something and kind of move it along like that. Um, these are very, you know, fragile insects, so um, I don't think they're going to be able to withstand a whole lot. Um, another thing on here, uh, there's, you know, vehicles, parking boats and stuff under hemlock trees, you know, wrong time of year can also play a role. Um, it's harder for them to drop out onto a boat and then be moved somewhere and somehow jump back onto a hemlock tree and they're too small to kind of crawl around, but if they get parked under a hemlock tree that's infested, get scales on it, then get parked, you know, up against a hemlock branch or something, it's a possibility, you know, so there's a lot of things that could be moving it and just to home in on a few, these are the big ones that we think um, we can talk about and the public will understand. So a little bit of background in Michigan. First detection was in 2006. It was up in Emmett County. You know, we have found multiple locations that we have been able to eradicate and we go back and monitor those. Uh, we did an extensive survey last year, last winter. Uh, didn't find anything up there. You know, Ben's crew was out looking pretty hard in that area. I know uh, some of the Forest Health crew was up there looking. Um, and for, for as far as we know, we actually got ahead of that one. These other two were in not very many hemlock areas. So. It was pretty much a planted tree that we just pulled out and burned on site. And there was nothing native around it that really um, we had to look at or deal with. Um, but we did the same thing in Ottawa, had in the Stephen counties. We went in, we tried to treat them, thought that we got it all, came back the next year, found more. Um, and uh, it just kind of got ahead of us. So, originally it was just three points, you know, and I think that was 2014. Um, by 2017, we had a lot of different points of infestation. And at this point, we realized, you know, vocal eradication probably wasn't going to fix our problem. So we went back to the drawing board, we drew up a statewide strategy plan uh, to contain uh, Hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, the first thing MDAR did was put a quarantine on the four counties that we knew HWA was in uh, to help slow the spread. Uh, we've had an external quarantine trying to keep hemlocks out of Michigan since they've been in the east for so long. Uh, but what we decided was we we're going to try to sever the infestation from the majority of hemlock in Michigan. So right now it's pretty much contained to the Lake Michigan shoreline. Okay? So we're going to start the farther north side that we have. Drew's been doing a lot of this work. Uh, Parks has been doing a lot of treatments. Start treatments on the north side and kind of push it south. And as we find localized uh, populations elsewhere will try to eradicate those local populations and really push it push it south. Now there's a chance for eradication. This is more of a containment strategy and we need to keep up getting out and looking um, and doing the survey detections because as soon as it gets established and out of hand farther north it kind of grows our strategy um, in the trash, and we'll have to start over do a lot of modifications at that point. This is kind of what it looks like on the northern end. Um, for some of you that don't know, this is Silver Lake State Park. Um, we 
did a lot of treatments up there. Bruce done a lot of treatments on private land uh, moving south. Uh, this pink area is roughly 1,300 acres of treatable area that we need to get to. Um, it's a big area. Um, and we're doing our best, and I think we're actually doing all right at this point um, for our treatment. Um, but something to just uh, make note of is every infestation point that we have in this area, what we're basing it off from for treatment is we go 800 feet out from that infested point and we treat all the hemlock trees in there. So if some of them we look at and we don't find HWA, well, it's within 800 feet of a known infestation. We treat it. Why do we treat it? Because insecticides don't work super fast. And there's two generations a year. That means that they'll disperse probably before the insecticide starts to work. Okay, so we want to be able to give us a little bit of a buffer. Uh, to get around, make sure that we treat everything, and the fact that chances are we're not catching everything, especially wool infestations. You know, they're in areas that we know HWA are. Um, so we want to make sure that we get around that as well. Now we're going to have to evaluate that 800 foot buffer um, to see if it's actually working, or if we need to go out a little bit farther, or what we need to do there. Um, that was just a number that we kind of come up with uh, based on research out east and um, different things that we've known about different insects and insects that are related to HWA. So right now it's just a stagnant number that um, we have no real back and forth. Uh, don't forget to report any suspect areas. Uh, we'd love to go out and take a look. Um, MDARD um, does all the collections, all the confirmations right now. Um, do not take a sample unless if you have a little sheet that says that you can. Um, through MDARD, you have to get a compliance agreement to move that kind of stuff. You can get in a lot of trouble for that. Usually what we suggest is you go out and take pictures, take a GPS point, send in the report, and MDARD will come out to you. Um, if you're a SISMA working on detection surveys, it might be a good idea just to contact MDARD, get that compliance agreement ahead of time so that you can take those samples, bag them, and send them in. So, treatment. There are a lot of different application methods that you can use. There's a lot of products out there that you can use. Um, I did throw in Cortec tablets because it's a unique, easy application to use. However, the research hasn't shown it to be effective. So I'm not sure if you would want to point anybody in that direction at this time. There are two main chemicals that we've been using, dinotepheron and imidacloprid. Dinotepheron moves a lot faster through the tree. Okay? So you will start seeing mortality within a couple months. So if you have a heavily infested tree, you're probably going to want to use dinotepheron. The problem with dinotepheron, other than it's extremely expensive, is the fact that it doesn't persist in those trees. So you know, you'll treat it, and then you might have to come back the year, next year, or the year after. If you want to continue control, which I wouldn't suggest um, if you have a good management um, plan in place. And the culprit is kind of the exact opposite. It moves very slow. Um, it takes over 12 months to start seeing mortality. So if you're talking about you know, two, three generations getting out before the insecticide actually starts to control HWA with them in corporate. Now you can use a tank mix of both of them so you can get the benefits of both sides. Um, but the good thing about them in corporate is it lasts a lot longer. You know, depending on how much you apply, what your soil types are, your application methods, 
usually you'll definitely get three to five years, but there has been research to show that it can go seven to ten years if you do it um, using uh, different application methods, different rates. Okay? And it is a heck of a lot cheaper. Group can test. Yeah. Just imagine if you're using that. So there is a lot of outreach to help uh, help people out with treatment. Uh, that they're geared towards uh, landowners. Um, I do have some of these publications up here. Uh, you guys are more than welcome to take, you know, whatever you guys want. Um, I would suggest that you take some and read through them, just to, especially if you have hemlock in your area, because it might be a concern at some point. Um, there are products out there that homeowners can buy at you know, at Meyer or other locations that do contain these chemicals. They are not as potent, um, but they can buy them. They can apply it themselves. They do work. Uh, they just won't be as effective. And here's a little bit of contact information if you run across it. MDARD again. Is a big one to go to. You can report it through MISSIN. Um, you can always call us and we'll, uh, we'll do it too. So 